Uh, hi, Ralf. Uh, nice to meet you. How are you today? Hi, Fabian. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Awesome. Yeah, uh, for us, it's also a pleasure to have uh, to have an author um, of a let's say famous uh, innovation book with us uh, today. And um, so at Bundle, we, we try to create um, more than just uh, corporate ventures. Also, we try to create content that is um, spreading the word about the uh, uh, newest and um, let's say most advanced methodologies, experiences, and uh, also inspires to to um, adapt um, ways for uh, building ventures and uh, creating new methodologies. So. We're happy to have you um, with Bundle. We're a corporate venture builder. Um, if you know, um, we we work in um, in every uh, industry. So we are industry agnostic, and um, we've been working with more than 200 different um, clients and products uh, projects um, across all continents. Um, and um, yeah, we're happy to have you on board. Um, my name is Fabian. I'm a senior venture architect at Bundle. Um, normally leading projects with clients and um, also maintaining um, methodologies and um, yeah, overview of methodologies. And um, therefore, yeah, I'm delighted to have you today. Um, how are you? I'm fine, absolutely fine, and, and, and thrilled to, to, to be your guest today and, and thrilled about the recognition for Beyond the Startup, which uh, when I saw the book was uh, making your uh, recommend, recommended list of books to read, uh, I was uh, humbled. Yeah, one of our one of our summer reads uh, in the company. <laughs> so um, you yourself, you were a founding partner of uh, Spark Forty Four, um, a let's say innovative and uh, industry first joint venture with uh, of Jaguar and Landrop. And um, under your leadership as a CEO, um, the company grew to uh, more than 1,200 people um, with business in uh, in over 18 countries. And uh, yeah, you wrote a book about it. We heard the name already, um, Beyond the Startup, and uh, also a new one, um, the uh, Building Corporate Soul. So um, maybe um, apart from all these information, um, like hard facts about you, maybe you tell us a little bit about uh, who you are, what you do, and um, yeah, what makes you Ralph as a person? <laughs> yes, so uh, you're right. I, I've written two books and I never thought I would even write one. So um, sometimes things happen when things happen. Um, the uh, I've been involved in uh, initially journalism uh, and then um, started back in 89-ish um, with, with McKen Erickson on um, on the advertising side of things and marketing side of things and actually um, spent 22 years there which is relatively unusual uh, as everybody considers the advertising industry to be a hop on hop off um, in the industry and you shouldn't make more than two or three years anywhere but um, there were so many uh, opportunities for to do great work with work with great great clients in, in, in different areas um, uh, both here in Germany as well as internationally um, it never really got boring, so um, the, um, it took me well 22 years with 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 McCann and and one evening <clears throat> back in 2010, and it was funny because I was just uh, returning from a from a from a leadership conference in San Francisco back to Frankfurt, and the phone rang, and, a, and an old colleague of mine, Steve Wolford, um, was on the phone, and I hadn't spoken to Steve probably for five or six years. And uh, he said, you know, um, I've got a great idea um, and would you be part of it? And, and that kind of uh, was the phone call that got me involved with, with Spark 44 because Steve was the founder and he was, um, he, he got, I wouldn't say the green light, but at least um, uh, a greenish light uh, from, from Jago Land Rover that uh, he could progress with taking the idea to reality and and uh, so I was one of the, the, the few people that he called up and uh, when he told me about the idea I thought he was a bit nuts uh, actually I thought he was a bit crazy <laughs> um, and I didn't didn't believe the word and I said it's too good to be true so um, uh, send me a business plan <laughs> uh, he, he did um, and uh, over the weekend I, 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 I looked through the business plan and then I made my thoughts and remarks but thought this is actually this could be viable this could be could work 
And so on, on the Sunday, uh, we, 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 we spoke again and, uh, well, that was kind of the virtual handshake at the time. And, and then we took it to, um, to a place where the greenish light became a green light and, and we could actually start. Uh, interesting. And uh, what do you think were the uh, the reasons for for him to uh, to get you on board uh, in particular? Well, I mean, he and I had worked together around the year 2000, 2001, 2003, um, In the McCann context, he was running the um, uh, the Global Interactive Agency, and I was in charge of one uh, uh, international client. And, and there was lots of collaboration that we had to do. And uh, both of us. Uh, really liked working with each other uh, because we were uh, we were a good team, um, very complementary skills and personalities. Um, and uh, he was keen to bring somebody on board who could help him with the international um, setup of, of the agency. And that's kind of what my initial focus uh, had been, uh, setting up uh, various offices um, ar around the world and and and. Uh, uh, ensuring that uh, the operations could actually um, happen and, and, and work out because it's no easy thing if you um, consider when we got the green light, green light meant uh, here's the budget um, and we want you to be up and running in, um, I think, three and a half months uh, globally. <laughs> so, um, there's a moment when you celebrate things and you say, well, well, we got it. And then the next morning you realize what you've gotten yourself into because um, hiring for, um, well, we, we, we started simultaneously in London, uh, Los Angeles, Shanghai and Frankfurt. So we had to bring in roughly 80 people um, uh, within just three and a half months. And if you look at the UK and look at the US, in China is, is is not is still a challenge, but like labor laws suggest that people can leave their jobs within a month or so. We look into Germany; that's kind of not exactly what's happening there. So, mm -hmm. um, um, but we got there, um, brought in the right people, and uh, off we went uh, for for a, for, a, for a few great great years actually. Maybe um, you can you can tell us a little bit about uh, what's behind uh, Spark 44. What was the idea, and um, why did you decide also to become part in this? And also, as, as you said, like very let's say hasty start um, or very um, um, ambitious start. Yeah. So <clears throat> we have to go back in time a little bit. Financial crisis 2008 2009. I think this is kind of the origin of the whole thing. Um, and at that time, lots of companies um, wanted to um, uh, well, improve their cash flow, and uh, lots of companies sold assets um, in quite significant numbers. And one of the companies was the Ford Motor Company, and they sold um, the brands of their what they called the Premier Automotive Group to uh, different investors. So Volvo, when it was uh, sold to Geely and, and Jaguar Land Rover was, was uh, sold to um, Tata in India. And um, once that deal happened and, and was done, the question was, so how do we leverage the potential um, of, of this company? And so Tata in, in installed a new management. Uh, and as you would do, um, they looked into all areas of the business. And one of the uh, issues they identified was the quality of the brands, especially the Jaguar brand. And um, in or during this process, um, Steve was a consultant for um, uh, for, for uh, Jaguar and Land Rover. Um, the question came about kind of what's the ideal solution for their agency setup, and because they were not happy with the agencies they were working with, and so. Um, Steve did an analysis and, and uh, the analysis basically showed that for a global company, um, despite it was quite a, I mean, you mentioned the volume of, of 1200 people, so it's quite significant. Um, still, you look into um, uh, many of the global networks, um, the size of the business was not so significant um, at the time. And one thing was very clear from the get go. 
which was that uh, general animal management required uh, senior agency management to be 100% dedicated um, uh, to, the, to their uh, efforts and, and their marketing programs. And um, one of these uh, sessions, um, the idea popped up of why don't we do it on our own and why don't you um, you set up an agency and I think Steve mm -hmm. made a very wise decision and said happy to do that but uh, actually I would like you to be our 50% partner uh, because for him it was it was critical that uh, Jaguar Landville was fully vested in, in the thing and um, uh, to ensure that this partnership uh, would also um, survive the first uh, storm and, and anybody who's ever worked in, in, a, in a global setup as it, can, it can be smooth on one end of the world but it's definitely not smooth at the other end of the world so uh, you better make sure that your organization is capable of managing that and and, uh, and he thought the joint venture structure would be a great um, way to ensure stability um, and support um, uh, from the get-go mm -hmm. and so um, I mean, when I when I joined, I still remember the, we had a, like a chem, chemistry meeting with the JLR, Jago and uh, uh, board directors, and and I, I got asked the question: So why 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 do you all leave McCann? Um, great agency, doing great work, and so on and so forth. And and I said, listen, um, when I got there um, a while back, my intention was to deliver great advertising, produce great 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 work. And as I was climbing up the management ranks, um, there was much too much focus on spreadsheets and uh, financial reporting and all these wonderful little things that you need, but not necessarily at the amount that, that uh, we had to deal with them. <clears throat> and so I said, you know, um, and that was kind of what Steve and I looked at in the business plan, keep the administration low as, as low as possible. Um, and um, yeah, focus focus on the work, and and uh, I think that that's pretty much what it, what what it was. What I didn't know then, um, and only realized after having started, was <clears throat> the the benefit of starting a company from scratch. Um, because I mean, whenever I got into any any kind of management ranks at McCann, um, you always get into the position and then you have to deal with whatever is there. Mm -hmm. But if you start a company from scratch, <clears throat> there's nothing that is there. You can look at this as a problem or as a big opportunity. I looked at it as a big opportunity and, and um, in hindsight, I think it's been a real gift because you could and we'll talk about culture in a second, but um, uh, you can make sure that the culture of the place is actually um, strong um, mm -hmm. and, and powerful and thriving culture, um, which very often when you take over uh, an existing company and, and, and uh, as a managing director or president or CEO, you have to fully understand what's there and then, um, well, try to understand how to course correct if necessary, or how to continue um, mm -hmm. if it's been running uh, well. So uh, I think the opportunity to start from scratch with a white uh, sheet of paper um, is something that I can only recommend to anyone is, is great. Yeah, I, I totally understand. It's uh, it's what we do in many of our projects as well, right? So um, building something from the ground up, developing an idea, creating ownership, and um, and also having the the ability and the freedom to do it, right? So it's uh, I feel like that's also one of the super important uh, things when you work in a, in a setting where um, where corporates are also innovating and creating ventures. And uh, I found uh, something that you said uh, at this uh, just earlier very interesting because you said um, we wanted to keep admin low and focus on the work. Um, which is uh, very interesting because you know in a, in a corporate setting um, someone would expect the uh, the complete opposite um, and also like if you work together with a corporate um, there is always lots of admin involved and um, also work that you do not feel necessary in a, in a term in terms of like making progress but to maintain let's say order of operations um, 
Was that uh, a challenge for, for you also uh, starting in the setting or um, how would you say that uh, the, the whole setup um, benefited um, your purpose of creating work and really like getting going and um, achieving that timeline of three and a half months? Well, I think um, if you if you got such a tough timeline, um, you need a good network that you can count on. Mm -hmm. um, you need, need some real professionals who know what they're doing, whether they join as freelancers for a while and in, in setting it up or or permanently. Um, and obviously, we all had the benefit um, of being in our late 40s, mid 50s. Um, back back then, and uh, so everybody had uh, a very healthy network of people that that we could we could count on. Um, mm -hmm. and at, the, at the same time, um, uh, all of us um, had enough experience to understand where to actually focus on and where to not focus on. Um, and um, since we were keen on creating an, an admin low. Um, an output high um, com company. Um, we made sure that each and every decision was uh, passing that filter in order to, uh, to to make it make it sensible. And and I mean, um, I think when we when we looked at it uh, afterwards, I think we we, we the, when I left the company, I think we uh, overachieved against the goal of the percentage rate that we had on 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 admin by twenty percent or so. So, mm -hmm. uh, because if if you if you um, if you're clear about where you want to go and you can you you install or instill a mindset um, with your people uh, so that they fully get where you're going and why you're going there uh, and what they can do to make sure it works, um, then it really works. <laughs> and and pe people understand and people um, see the value uh, and see how they can contribute um, uh, to that goal. And, and I think that's what we've seen in, in spades. Lots of people were doing things that um, uh, where they were clear about their small part of the, of the whole equation. And, and found ways to to improve things in in, in ways that we would have never had thought about. So mm -hmm. um, it's all about creating um, that environment where people fu are fully understand do fully understand where things are going, where things are headed, and why they are headed that way, and then give them the power to um, to actually make it happen. And um, I've seen much much more people who. Um, who embraced that opportunity um, than people who had issues with, uh, with it. And mm -hmm. I'm going to give you one example. In the hiring phase, in the initial hiring phase, um, and, and put yourself into that into, into my shoes at the time, you're trying to hire whatever 15, 20 people for a company that doesn't exist yet, um, with no office, no nothing. And um, I think the only thing you have to convince is, you, is the power of yourself and the and the and the passion and, and the um, the um, excitement about uh, the opportunity and obviously um, the client uh, with Jaguar and and, and, and Land Rover in the back uh, helped to reassure people to that, that this is not a crazy guy in a coffee shop trying to hire someone for a job that doesn't exist, right? One question there, maybe I can jump in. Um, did you already also formulate some form of a vision or something uh, where you wanted to go? Like, how did you uh, how did you approach um, the people that you wanted to hire? We in the initial phase, we basically um, approached people by saying, "You can be part of something that doesn't uh, exist yet, um, but it's uh, formed by." Uh, uh, recognized professionals within the industry uh, glo globally, and uh, if it works out, uh, you're part of the of the team that actually uh, has uh, revitalized the Jaguar brand. And mm -hmm. um, this proposition actually uh, worked very, very well. Um, and not only with uh, people that were focused on cars, but Jaguar as a brand 
as a luxury brand or premium brand, uh, I think uh, did a lot of help in that in, in, in that job because people got it like, okay, that is something I can I can uh, I can add nicely to my resume, and if it's great, uh, the sky is the limit. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's uh, that's interesting. Um, what I find exciting is that you said you were looking for very specific profiles uh, and um, people that had already lots of experience because that's also something that uh, that we encounter uh, oftentimes in our um, in our projects that um, we work in in settings where um, the methodology is not so well known. Also, um, the approach to entrepreneurship and risk taking and uh, and working under uncertainty. Are um, are uh, let's say not as strongly um, um, yeah, founded in, in in the values and in the work that have people have been doing internally. Um, did you also work with um, internal people from from the two let's say mother companies, or um, did you only look outside? We only looked outside because um, the intention, one of the intentions why um, Jaguar and Land Rover. Uh, agreed to uh, that that joint venture uh, model because, as you can imagine, it's very unusual. It was an industry first, so it's like okay, interesting. Why are they doing that? Was and, and our our first chairman uh, Hans Riedel um, talked about that quite a lot, and uh, he said, well, part of the reason why this makes a lot of sense um, for for Jaguar and Land Rover is to add an external flywheel to the transformation of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, because obviously the company had great ambitions. The Tata uh, um, owners wanted to see growth uh, in, in, in huge dimensions. Um, um, I think when, I, when, when, when we started, I think the total volume of cars they sold was like around 200,000. And I think when I stepped down, it was like 600 something. Uh, thousand so uh, tripled basically uh, and, and obviously um, um, there was a concern that the uh, organization wasn't ready for it and hence any opportunity to uh, speed up the transformation um, was critical and and that's kind of part of of, of the role uh, the agency played at, at least in the, in, the, in the early years big time um, to yeah. help on general grand plan achieve those those big and, and uh, ambitious goals i uh, yeah i totally agree that this uh, that's a challenge in many many big corporates and uh, i would find it very interesting on how you might have approached this back in the day um also with an organization that might not be fully ready for such a swift transition or such a swift change and and um, also let's say accelerated growth and um, and um, probably not just that but the implications of it being a technological change or general brand change or whatever everything is involved um, how did you uh, deal with that um in a few different ways i think that there isn't the one answer to to, to that question um, if you would ask some of the people client side uh, at the time uh, they would probably say when the when when the when the news broke that this was happening nobody really knew what this was what, what, what this would, would would mean to the organization um and like when it's when it got started it felt probably like a tsunami hitting the organization um because we were so determined and we obviously um, had huge backing from from the top of the company uh, to ensure that uh, this the, this or this or that or the, the other needed to happen, um, and I think that actually um, uh, got us a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, tailwind, uh, if if you like. Um, and then um, obviously it's been a creative business, um, and we looked at two things in the first place. One was the uh, digital ecosystem, which didn't exist before we uh, got in. So um, and as you know, developing something like this isn't happening in two weeks. It, it takes takes months or a year even. Um, and, um, and at the same time, uh, we had to 
uh, manage the, the, the going business, the running business, in order to make sure that uh, uh, there was enough demand crea uh, created so that the um, um, planning uh, ambitions were, uh, were hit. But then very, very early on, um, we've been able to um, um, get some, some powerful work um, through the organization, which got us into the uh, Super Bowl in, in 2013 and, and, and the work there for with British villains and the Good to Be Bad campaign um, won us kind of every award that you can uh, want to have, uh, actually. Um, and, and with a very bold campaign. And, and this was something that actually um, uh, helped to convince even those, even those that were not really convinced because they were still trying to hold on to what, 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 what was there before. Um, so the, the, the combination of uh, excellent work, and remember that's what, kind of why I wanted to get into this because I felt there was an opportunity to do that without focusing too much on admin. Um, uh, plus a client that is, uh, or that was fully behind um, that transformation uh, was probably the winning winning formula uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. I, I find it uh, interesting because he said like you won the campaign with a very bold, um, uh, you won the, the awards with a very bold campaign. Uh, I can imagine that uh, the entire operation of Spark 44 must have been a it's a very bold undertaking at the time, um, which also required a, let's say, very bold culture and, and people with lots of ambition, but at the same time, the the need to fit into an organization that is rapidly growing and uh, that requires everybody to not just think about their own ambitions, but also the ambitions of, a, of the company itself. Um, which I find very interesting because especially if you work with corporates, um, there are people that uh, have totally different ambitions from uh, working in such a uh, vehicle, right? So, or working with such a vehicle. Um, I would be very curious about, uh, to hearing about like, uh, what kind of culture did you establish there and, uh, and how did you manage these, um, let's say, characters and experiences and ambitions and all at once that is definitely not something that always steers in the, the same direction, but also pulls into different directions. Yeah, I think um, you remember that I said we started in LA, Shanghai, Frankfurt and London. So London and Frankfurt is kind of close in terms. Shanghai and LA are like 12 hours flight, 12 hour flights away. Um, and so initially what we did um, we said, well, we got four offices, but we've actually got a global operation. And people were asking, where is your headquarters? And we always said, our oh, headquarters go to a meeting. And at the time, this was 2011, people, lots of people didn't even know what go to a meeting was. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I mean, today, if, you, if you, we would say we're on a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting like this one, uh, everybody would go like, yeah, of course. But at that time, um, uh, web conferences were, well, something very exclusive, rarely happening, and so on and so forth. So part of what we did was we ensured that there was permanent um, communication between those four offices. Um, and we ensured that, um, obviously, we, we had like four offices, 20 people each, and you would think 80 people is quite a lot. Um, it is and it isn't because you, with 80 people, you can't have every specialist um, competence in every location, which we actually thought was a blessing because that forced these offices to work together despite being uh, geographically far, far apart from each other. And um, that helped to um, avoid one of the biggest issues in culture, corporate cultures, which is silos. Um, so yes, of course, with the American agency was dealing with the North American clients, but at the same time, they were involved into the global work or into the European work or in China um, uh, and so on. So um, that helped uh, quite, quite a lot. And um, what also helped was that we, um, we collectively um, supported the purpose that we had 
I mean, so with the initial vision was to, to make history with it with with uh, by, by restoring Jaguar brand. But for ourselves, we said, well, <clears throat> the the, pur the purpose um, that we would serve would be to challenge conventions so that uh, amazing things can happen. Um, and and that purpose, um, alongside a true value system, and our values were be bold, be brave, be honest, um, gave license to our people to challenge convention um, mm -hmm. and to be bold in their in their um, approach, be bold in their um, recommendations, um, be brave to actually take this to each and every level that was required uh, within the client corporate uh, world. But also keep that logic of honesty um, as, as a very uh, important value. And, and uh, you remember what we talked about at the beginning about the joint venture it was a 50-50 joint venture. Um, um, and and, and I, I still remember at the beginning when, it, when this became public, Many former colleagues asked me, oh, and how do you do deal with the numbers and, and all of that? Are you, are you really sharing those? And I was, yeah, we're sharing those. We're completely transparent. There's complete transparency about it. Um, because if they know, the clients know what's commercially uh, happening, they will understand kind of which decisions have which implications, which very often in that world, clients don't know because they're not told. And there's this, this huge um, issue of mistrust um, because of no transparency. And we felt we got nothing to hide, actually. Uh, rather the opposite, we felt uh, it would help us um, manage the business um, in, in, a, in a better way and uh, also help us to keep admin low because there was nothing to hide. <laughs> um yeah interesting uh what i was uh, also interested in um because i mean like uh, having such a bold goal of uh, being live within three months um would you say that uh, you were working with a let's say comfortable cushion of budget or um did you have lots of restrictions and had to improvise on it um like what was the setting there well um part of um the the approach was um, um Better, faster, cheaper. Um, better was number one, faster number two, and cheaper number three. But still meant that we needed to be um, providing more value for money than uh, other solutions outside the joint venture structure. And we we've been able to do that. That's kind of what drove the growth um, across the world. Um, and so. Um, Obviously, we had one big advantage that many startups don't have. We didn't we didn't have to go pre-seed and, and series A, B, C, and so on. Um, mm -hmm. We we basically um, had the benefit of working um, against a, a a business plan, um, um, and uh, due to the impact that our cheaper way of working uh, created. Uh, had the benefit of uh, being always cash positive, which obviously is uh, compared to to any any startup that's on on their own uh, a huge advantage. But that doesn't mean or didn't mean that we could do whatever we wanted uh, because we had set for ourselves the goal that being ca cash positive is is critical because we don't want to get into um, corporate debt, n neither with our joint venture partner nor with any any banking mm. um, institute or so on and so forth. So um, we always had a very conservative financial planning um, that allowed us to actually manage the growth of the agency without uh, ever going to a bank. Um, and, and that's because we had great uh, finance people who um, un understood that uh, their professional um, approach should rather be a liberating um, approach for the company than a constraining folk, uh, focus for the, for the company. And so we were very lucky um, uh, to, to that extent. And, and you can imagine, I mean, um, we spoke about the, the early days of, of three and a half months until we had like these four offices. And then three years later, 
we initially were working with the Jaguar brand only, and then as the concept for the agency had always been to um, uh, be open to other clients as well. And we always discussed this once a year saying, well, are we ready to do this? And when we all felt we were ready to do this, the uh, Jaguar Land Rover people said, yeah, we th also think you're ready to do this. But before you go to the outside market, can you please take care of the Land Rover brand? And so <clears throat> Land Rover was like three times the volume as Jaguar. Um, and so you know, when the decision was taken, there was another three and a half months. It was by the time we were six agencies, six, six country, or five countries, six agencies, um, we had to open up another 10 in, in another four months. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and I still remember Steve and I had this conversation, uh, which was like, should we really, really do this or not? And because we were concerned about the culture. And, um, and I said to Steve, because we had uh, like point people, liaison uh, people in various markets where we didn't have an office, where we had one or two people serving in that market and they had been there for like two, two and a half years and had grown with the agency, had basically, basically um, adapted the culture, died in rule as the Brits say. Um, and said, so, well, for eight out of these 10 agencies that we have to uh, set up in three months, we got people who have been with us for two and a half years, so they understand the culture and we can fully trust them to make that happen for the other two find two people. I mean, we had to find 80 people in, in, in three months, so we will find two people. We actually found two people, and one was a, a, a real star. He was the perfect decision. And the other one was the, the total opposite. So we thought we had the greatest guy on earth, and it turned out three, three four weeks later, that this was a big hiring mistake. Um, and one of the big learnings is when if you figure out you made a big mistake, don't try to um, find a hundred ways to get it right because usually it doesn't get right. And, uh, mm -hmm. and we took the decision to, to make a change very quickly. <clears throat> but other than that, uh, I think all the leadership of all the agencies were pretty much um, right on the money. And, and, and uh, because they knew the culture, they were able to uh, bring the culture, bring that culture in their local uh, local geographical culture um, to life with their 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 people um, offices that they had, had the privilege to lead. Mm -hmm. And it was a big, big uh, achievement, I think, that um, allowed us to, to actually make uh, manage that growth. I, uh, I find it very interesting, um, especially the scaling part, because I think that's um, one of the biggest problems for, for startups, just for, for classical startups, but also for corporate startups um, at a certain point to uh, not just scale the operations, but also scale the team behind it and maintain the culture or um, at least adapt it in a way that it, the core is still intact. And um, is that something that also inspired you to, uh, to write your book um, and uh, to, to really communicate it to, to the outside world or well, I think when, as you mentioned, I, I wrote two books, right? I, I wrote Beyond the Startup and Building Corporate Soul. And Building Corporate Soul was inspired when I stepped down as CEO and, and received all those farewell messages that you would expect to receive. Um, I received them as well, but to me, those farewell messages were much, much deeper than what you would normally think you would you would get. and. Um, it was very moving, I have to say, and 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 uh, I was thinking about it for a few weeks um, uh, as they were coming in very, very uh, one by one, and within like two or three days, I, it was like crazy. Mm. And I thought, um, because they were all focusing or predominantly focusing on what the agency had meant to those people. Um, and because I was the last of the founders to leave the company, uh, everybody figured out that this was a big change for, for the company itself. And um, the messages focused on the culture we had built, the opportunities we had provided uh, people with, and the ability to actually grow um, in, 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 in a very unique um, uh, in environment. And, after two, three weeks, I was thinking about it. I was like, okay, so 
I've got two choices. I can uh, keep them on my iPhone in my WhatsApp uh, inbox and in a sentimental sentimental moment every now and then uh, look at them and feel good, or actually share the share the learning because I think there's a lot mm. to learn from what we did, um, and the uh, and that that's what led to writing building corporate soul and the framework of the soul system, which is based on three levels: the shared uh, purpose. Uh, in our case, that was challenge convention, so that anything, uh, so that amazing thing can, uh, things can happen. A clear vision, clear mission, uh, clear set of values, and a clear spirit, uh, and intended culture for the for the organization, and then the shared behaviors inside the firm. And I think we were very good at um, codifying the behaviors and experiences that people had with the organization by numerous things, whether those were international exchange programs, uh, uh, a very um, innovative um, uh, evaluation structure where people got their personal evaluations every three months um, connected with a financial um, bonus. Um, that, that evaluation uh, procedure was linked to corporate values. Um, so everybody was measured against the same values, which also in in uh, in, in in return uh, ensured that every every individual inside the agency had a, uh, a, a values conversation with their manager every three months. So uh, people really mm -hmm. understood what those values meant, and not just as wallpaper, but what they meant for their personal job, whatever it's been. Um, things like. Um, uh, innovation weeks and, and, and international um, um, transfers of, of, of people. I was just reading an article the other week about how the issue of uh, managers hoarding their uh, people, uh, which is mean, meaning not allowing people to actually take the next step inside the organization, but in a different um, office or a different country. Mm -hmm. And I had watched this a hundred times at McCann, and, and, I, and, I, and I never really understood it because I always felt if you don't let people uh, make that move, then they will make the move going somewhere else. So actually, for the company, it's better you, they make them inside the company to wherever, and they might come back after two years or, or three years. But if they uh, leave for another company, the chances for them to come back are very, very, very light. So. I think we've been very successful um, in doing that. We've, we've, uh, one of our colleagues in, in Los Angeles created a week of innovation called Sparkapalooza, um, and we all were like, "What are, what, what is this Palooza thing?" And then he explained, and we said, "Well, this is cool. This is great. We're going to do that everywhere." And then we brought offices together, small offices, like two offices, do it one year in one location, next year in the other location, bring the people together, collaborate. Um, Lots of initiatives along those lines, and um, um, yeah, an exchange program where people could just we called it Spark BNB, uh, which was an initiative by two MDs who said, "Well, bring one person to one office for for a month or two, and, and exchange it with another person for the same time. Can we do this? Of course, we can do this because no big deal. If you think about it, it's really no big deal. It's just an Airbnb and, a, and an air ticket, nothing else, and so." By allowing all of these initiatives, um, we created a, uh, a red thread throughout the organization that ensured that people permanently had the um, had a, had a visible experience or, or tangible experience of life is different here, and mm -hmm. the difference is a good difference, it's something that I can benefit from, that is valuable to myself, to my colleagues, my peers, and to the work. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that uh, when, when I talk to people right now, because it's now nearly three years since I left, um, everybody still um, talks highly of these, these, these moments, so it's great. Yeah, and I, what, what I find super interesting is that you've been way ahead of your time, right, with, the, with this approach now. Everybody's talking about remote work and let people do their work from wherever they work and so on and so on. But this has been only, let's say, on the surface for for like maybe two years and since we had the pandemics and people were kind of forced to do it. Um, but you already you lived a change before it was 
it was normal or it was conventional. Um, uh, did you have any, let's say, also hesitations from, uh, let's say, other people in your uh, ecosystem that were uh, maybe not convinced of this approach? And how did you deal with them? I think within the agency system, not really, um, because everybody knew, the whole management team knew from, from the beginning that what we would be doing would be challenging in all aspects and including the the challenges of, of, of the time commitments and the energy commitments that we were asked from, from, from everyone. So um, whenever we were looking at some of these initiatives, the, the, the general spirit was, um, well, sounds good. Let's let's try it. If it doesn't work, we can still we can stop it. But but why should we stop something if somebody's put enough energy into it and has thought it through? And um, every now and then, um, ideas or initiatives were tweaked a little bit so that they uh, could really work. But they were were not tweaked in order to make sure it got board approval or something like that. They were tweaked to actually accelerate it, make it better, um, or have more people. Um, uh, in enjoying it. So I think the, the organization as a, as a whole was um, uh, behind doing these these uh, unusual um, things and um, actually it paid off a big time. And, and I think part of what we did um, probably did a bit too late, uh, could have done earlier, but hindsight is always a wonderful thing. Um, in the beginning, we didn't have a real HR um, team. We only hired a proper HR director, I think, uh, two years into the thing. Luckily, before we got the big um, uh, um, growth um, from 250 people to 750 people in four months, um, but um, I think that helped us a lot um, to, to professionalize things, to um, mm -hmm. also bring in uh, HR technology to uh, help us uh, be, to stay on top and not uh, kill everybody with the administration of uh, of, of those things. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think uh, and always going back to our purpose of challenging conventions. So that gave license to everyone to actually mm -hmm. beyond the this or this is how we've been doing it here so far. Uh, so we can actually incentivizing people for for doing it differently than what's the industry standard. I find it inspiring, uh, and I also think like especially with the two corporates, like big corporates in the background, uh, and also automotive, which is maybe in the luxury industry a little bit different, but as an automotive, uh, it's more traditional, right? It's more, um, let's say, um, yeah, it's traditional business and. Um, did you experience any major headwinds um, uh, also with your approach, which was back then probably rather radically different than uh, what has been uh, taken on before? Yeah, of course. And how the, the hmm? Sorry. And how did you deal with the with the headwind and maybe also the um, <laughs> the the stuff that wasn't that nice? Um. Well, first of all, of course, there were headwinds um, because you can't have a global organization and expect everybody to be, to only uh, applaud everything you're doing. It ain't going to happen. And there's always a problem somewhere, so you have to deal with it. Um, I think what we what we successfully did was to to use that um, value system: be bold, be brave, be honest also in our dealings with our client partners. And obviously that's in some cases easier than in others. Um, but um, over time you, you build trust and you earn trust and, and um, people understand that when you have a point of criticism or an issue that you're putting on the table, it's not, you're putting, you're putting, you're not putting it on the table to damage someone or, or um, Create, create an issue for someone, um, you're actually doing that to improve something. 
and um, and and uh, those are those conversations that I think nobody really likes um, because it's always tough. It's tough for the one who has to accept that there's an issue, uh, but it's also tough for the one who's conveying the message um, because it's, it's a thin line. Um, yeah. And you, you got to balance kind of um, the current uh, relationship with the future relationship and make sure people get it. So that is, um, is not trivial and and but but I think the 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 trust level um, once you've built it to a, to to a certain degree that you can talk about things openly um, is something that is so valuable. I mean, I, I mentioned the, the the one hiring decision that we took for that one MD that was not the right decision and. Uh, was a bit especially tricky because that person was recommended from someone without a, within the client organization of that local market. And um, so I had to, had to talk to the person and say, well, listen, it, it's not working. And it, it, it isn't working for one, two, three, four, five, six um, reasons. And uh, I need your support because we need to let that person go and we need to bring a new person in. Um, and and since you recommended the person, it's a tricky conversation. Um, but that 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 individual was was uh, um, uh, grown up enough to understand by saying, "Okay, I get it." From my experience, that person was a great professional. But if he doesn't work out in your organization, and I'm holding you responsible to deliver for us, then you have. The license to uh, to make the decision, but you got to make got to be open about these things, and you got to find a, find a context. And that was something that was unusual, because um, obviously when when you consider that joint venture and the flywheel logic in the beginning that I, that I mentioned in the beginning, um, the expectation from the Jaguar Land Rover management was to have an an eye level partner on the marketing side with 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 the agency. Um, and uh, some of those lo of those local clients didn't really appreciate that because they felt uh, we were in between them and their uh, directors. And so um, that's a tricky uh, situation that you can only manage by by building uh, trust trusted relationships um, everywhere and and with 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 most people, so that you can. Um, use those relationships when you need them. Um, mm. Because one thing is for sure, if you're not in there for the short haul, you're going to need it at one point. <laughs> and um, where would you where would you say, let's say, um, I think one of our two last questions um, before we um, end, but where would you say, lady, uh, let's say the biggest similarities of um, building a corporate joint venture uh, versus maybe also a corporate venture, which is built from the inside of a corporation, from the inside of a company, would you say that there are similarities? And uh, if so, what would they be? I think the biggest difference, so I'm starting with, not with a similarity, but with difference. I think the biggest difference is when you do that joint venture, you have um, speed on your side. Mm -hmm. When you do it inside um, the firm and you've got to, Deal with all those rules and regulations and 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 outspoken and not outspoken laws inside the firm um, that can uh, stop innovation big time. Um, and and I have seen a lot of those. I mean the um, I mean many companies have their own startups um, and and by definition. Uh, leave them outside the, the company uh, and just with a, with a bit of financial con uh, control. Um, that's much, much better than doing it from the from the inside. I think if you're a successful company and 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 you want to uh, add something to 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 your your uh, organization, I think you can do that. But if you're in if you're in in in, in difficult waters. Um, 
you might not want to do that because you might you might be much much better off by putting it outside the firm, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and 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 just providing the capital to to actually uh, to make it make it happen um, because um, corporate. The bigger the company, the corporate structures can actually kill a lot of things, and kill kill can kill lots of good ideas. And um, yeah, I mean it's and, and you got to act fast. I mean we grew very fast, um, very very fast. And uh, uh, and if we would have been doing that with the um, laws of our joint venture partner or the regulation of our joint joint venture partner, it would have been much much harder um, mm -hmm. to do it. And I get why they have those um, those, those, those rules and, and, and regulations. For instance, they always do audits, and we like that a lot. We ask them to send their auditors to us as well, because we felt it was perfect. Because they they would come in and tell us where where there were issues, so that we could fix them. Um, yeah. And people looked at us, and, why why are you so happy about the auditors coming in? And we said, well, it just saves us lots of time because they they find the issues much faster. Because we are looking at something else, and 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 it's a benefit. I think it's a benefit for both. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, truly, in a corporate environment, it's a tough one um, to to create innovation um, uh, inside a firm unless your company is built on innovation, and not all companies yeah. are. Yeah, or you have a let's say a very very adjusted governance for uh, specifically those innovation or venturing projects um, where it's kind of decoupled from the from the core operations from the core business um, and gives a lot of freedom and uh, the ability to think freely and act freely and uh, also develop your own culture right yes and and i mean i uh, i had the pleasure to to spend some time with professor riley in sanford on on his um, thoughts on ambidextry uh, of having um, the the innovation company close to you, but not inside your your, your mm -hmm. firm, and I think um, I mean he's put a full pro program against this, uh, and, and it's such such a such a critical learning. Yeah, cool. Um, then uh, I mean I really enjoyed it so far, and I think we could talk for for lots and lots and lots of time because I think you have many stories to tell and um, I, I find it really inspiring um, also the approach that you lead culture first and people first and then everything build everything around it um, so um, if you were to do it again if you were to get the chance to do it again um, what would be your let's say three main things that you would uh, tackle first or also what would you recommend to um, to people also in, in our network um, that are in a situation um, facing a similar situation as, as you were back then, or um, yeah, what would you recommend them? What were the three things where you would say like this, this, and this is most important and uh, will probably get you onto a path of success um, in the near future? I think the first one is probably choose your partners wisely, um, because every now and then you come across people who tell you. Everything is great, and in reality, not everything is great. Mm -hmm. um, when you when you get into such an environment of, of of starting a company, you need people that you can fully trust. Similar to like when Steve called me, um, mm -hmm. knew from our previous relationship that um, this would would would, would work out <clears throat> well if I was interested. Um, so I think that is 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 ultra critical. I think the second thing. Is um, think about your purpose um, in the moment when you when you when you are ready to make that decision. Um, people often think about purpose as uh, as a nice to have. Um, I'd say if you're on your own, it's perhaps nice to have. It's good to have it. But the moment you are more than yourself, uh, more people than yourself, you definitely need it. That's why I call mm -hmm. it a shared purpose. Um, and uh, by shared, I mean shared by the leadership team and shared with every stakeholder, especially the empl employees. Uh, so you better have that, um, mm -hmm. and you are you better you better ready to to um, to live by it. And the third 
um, piece is uh, don't take yourself too serious because there's other people around you who probably do things better, see things earlier um, and clearer than yourself because you're very much in a tunnel and, 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 and focusing on certain things and, and, and often you don't see other, other things around you. And mm. uh, be open to um, when people tell you these things because um, if you don't do that, if you, if you ignore those signals or those warning signs or those hands up, um, it'll come after you big time and um, small problems should be fixed for them to stay small problems because if you don't, sometimes they're too big. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, thanks a lot, Ralph, for taking this time on this uh, on this Monday. Um, we hope to uh, keep you in our network and um, hopefully also maybe engage in another conversation in the, in the near future. Um, also, uh, maybe uh, regarding your book, uh, Beyond the Startup, um, where can people find it, buy it, purchase it? Um, pretty much everywhere where you can buy books. So, uh, I mean, pretty much any bookstore. Um, uh, sometimes it takes a bit longer for to arrive because I think it's, it's UK and US. Um, um, warehouses, but uh, um, yeah, any bookstore will be, be able to source it, and, and Amazon and, 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 and Co will be able to ship it to you uh, quickly. Yeah, well, wonderful. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot again um, for taking the time for being with us, uh, for writing the book and sharing your experiences even more. I think it's uh, it's very important we're just preparing also pieces for for uh, conferences and uh, i think this uh, gives a lot of more insights to also share with the audiences there um and uh, yeah we're very thankful um and uh, as i said we're very happy to have you again uh, if you like to of course um and uh, yeah wishing you a wonderful rest of the week and uh, rest of the year and enjoy the uh, success of your book well thank you very much much Fabian. it's been my pleasure